Hello, everyone. Thank you again for joining us and welcome to the second session of the first day of the Arab uh, Oil and Gas Academy Entrenchment Program. Uh, this is again Nihal Munir. I'll be your moderator for the day um, as the last session. We will be only reading questions on the Q&A tab and YouTube Live. We won't be looking into the chat part. I just have one thing. Please keep the questions on the Q&A part only relevant to the technical content of the lectures. Any other questions you have about the internship, please do it. Uh, please send that on the Facebook just to, I, I'll be able to filter the questions and we can give like a relevant lecture at the end. Um, Without any further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker for the day, uh, Engineer Khaled Saleh. Uh, he joined Schlumberger in 2013 as a wireline field engineer with a primary focus on open hole logging portfolio. In 2016, he moved to Data Processing Center as a petrophysicist to provide multi-domain projects in Egypt, North America, land, and Gulf of Mexico offshore. In 2020, uh, he became the wireline petrophysicist and acoustics domain champion in charge of evaluation services, business development by providing technical consultancy to clients in Egypt, Sudan, Jordan, and Lebanon. Uh, Engineer Khaled, over to you. All right, thank you very much for this introduction. So good morning, good afternoon, uh, wherever you guys are based. So today we'll be uh, talking about uh, open hole logging uh, through wireline. It will be an introduction session. We'll be going through the first phase, why do we need to log? And then we'll be going through the different services that we provide. And then later, I'll just uh, go through an overview on um, how to do a basic formation evaluation in order to resolve the different parts of this exercise. So the agenda for today, We'll be going through briefly through the EMP life cycle. Uh, why do we need to logging? What's logging? And the different types of logging environment. Uh, then we'll be followed by the different services. Uh, I've grouped them into families, let's say. Nuclear resistivity, nuclear magnetic resonance, uh, sonics and acoustics. Uh, well bore imaging and dip meter. And finally, through pressure points and, and fluid sampling. Uh, towards the end of the presentation, I'll be a, give, giving you an overview of the formation evaluation on TechLog, which is one of the uh, uh, softwares that uh, is provided through Schlumberger through SS, which is Software Integrated Solutions. <coughs> All right, so EMP life cycle is divided into four phases, uh, explore, appraise, produce, and develop. So Explore starts with a very basic, um, let's say, uh, part of this exercise where we acquire um, the surface seismic and through the interpretation and the processing of the surface seismic, we reveal what's there beneath uh, on the subsurface. Uh, through exploration and surface seismic, we build our uh, model and using this model, we start to select where to drill. Uh, based on this exercise, we drill our well, and then we uh, start the logging phase. So logging typically uh, falls under the appraisal section of this MP life cycle. Once we fully appraise the well and do the formation evaluation, we start to uh, case the well, perforate, and then produce. Once we drill multiple wells and uh, start production for a certain period of time, we start to look how to develop the field through uh, laterals or uh, direction drilling in order to increase the uh, recovery of the reservoir that we're dealing with. So in a nutshell, logging or wireline logging in specific falls under the appraise uh, part of the EMP life cycle. So what's logging? Logging is the process of measurement where we lower different tools on we require uh, different services uh, into the well bore. Uh, 
So logging can be done on different uh, different parts or different uh, services through, uh, first of all, wireline, whether through the wireline cable or TLC, which stands for tough logging condition, which basically happens through dr drill pipes. So what happens in this case is that we uh, connect our uh, wireline tools uh, through into the drill pipes and then we acquire wireline logging. This is typically um, uh, very common when we have uh, problems in uh, following the cable wireline logging. Uh, the third type of uh, wireline uh, conveyance is tractor, where we basically lower our tools on a mechanical uh, mechanical tool in order to help us uh, reach uh, and uh, start the logging process. And this is very typical in horizontal wells. The second type of logging is through LWD, <coughs> which stands for logging while drilling. <coughs> and in this case, we lower uh, our LWD tools on drill pipes, and uh, they are basically uh, logging while the well is being drilled. Uh, another type of uh, wireline logging is through BIT, and this is a new addition to Slumberger where we had acquired uh, the SLIM tools. Uh, these tools can be, uh, uh, can be drilled and can be actually um, logged through the drilling BIT. So uh, this can also be done through wireline. And finally, the stick line, which is um, a type of service that we can provide to our client. It's uh, very basic in terms of measurements, but still it's very uh, good into application when it comes to uh, case tool environment. So the logging process. Logging, basically we acquire different uh, services, let's say different data at different depths. And through the acquisition of these different tools at different sensors, we start to um, build up the data response versus depth. So in this, in this slide, I'm showing a uh, schematic or the blogging process where we start at, let's say time zero at the very bottom of the well near the TD. Uh, and this time we have uh, actually powered up the tool where we basically started to acquire the data. And then after a certain period of time, uh, as the tool moves up the well, we start to get uh, multiple points. These points are uh, being uh, logged simultaneously. So we acquire from each and every tool and each and every sensor, uh, the type of uh, log that we need to acquire. And then finally, through this different sampling rate, we can uh, connect these dots in order to uh, show what we typically see in a wireline log which is the log response for the formation. So uh, wireline logging is done through a cable where we lower our tools into the borehole. These tools can be combined differently. A very basic or a very common um, type of uh, tool is the triple combo, or even sometimes we go with a quad combo. Of course, there are different services and different types of uh, tools that can be um, uh, integrated or combined, but for simplicity, we'll be uh, focusing more on the triple combo, and then we'll be going through the advanced uh, type of uh, tools uh, later during this presentation. So logging can, be, can happen into different, different phases of the, of the well, let's say the life of the well. So we can acquire open hole logging when there is just uh, the borehole being drilled, and typically in the borehole, they'll be drilling fluid. So there is no casing and there is no cement. And this is the, our primary focus for today, which is open hole logging. The second type of logging is uh, the one that happens when there is a casing and a cement into the borehole. So uh, this is the case where we start to uh, check the integrity of the cement and uh, do a typical CBL, VDL, which is uh, cement bond log and variable density log. Uh, later in time, once we evaluate our reservoir through the open hole logging and then runs the cement, we typically expect to perforate. And this is the third phase of the, of the well, where we start to identify our pay zones or reservoir, and then we decide which type of perforation that needs to be done. Once we perforate the well, the fluid inside the reservoir starts flowing all the way up to the surface. 
So uh, these are the different phases of the log environments. First of all, the open hole, and then followed by the case hole where we run cement and the casing. And then once we identify our pay zones using open hole uh, interpretation, we start to go to the third phase where we start to perforate. So open hole logging or uh, formation evaluation is a very critical part of the appraisal uh, phase of the EMP life cycle because basically it identifies the main pillars, whether to continue developing the field or just go and plug and abandon and then go look for something else somewhere else. So typically open hole logging, it's important because it resolves primarily four pillars of the open hole formation evaluation. Starting off with the lithology description, what type of lithology do we have, type of formation, shale, sand, carbonate, dolomite. And then it goes to the next phase, which is the reservoir porosity, how much how much porosity do we have, which should represent the storage capacity of the reservoir? How much fluid that this reservoir can hold in order to be uh, economically producible? And once the reservoir porosity is identified, we go to the saturation or the hydrocarbon saturation. So we identify the porosity and then we see how much of this pore space is, is filled actually with hydrocarbon and how much is filled with water. The more water we have, the less economical this uh, reservoir would be the higher the hydrocarbon, that's our primary target. Once we identify the hydrocarbon saturation, we need to go and see the type of the fluid that we have, whether it's gas or oil. And this has different techniques in order to identify the fluid type and sampling. So basically, the wireline logging is done and it's important because it identifies the lithology, reservoir porosity, saturation, as well as the fluid type. In order to do this, we need to identify, as a result, our typical um, outputs of the formation evaluation, which is the gross section of the, of the pay zone. And then we identify the net rock, which is typically uh, the rock volume, uh, like let's say, for example, um, sand minus shale. And then we identify the net reservoir where we basically ap apply a second cutoff in order to identify how much pore spaces that we have. So uh, once we identify the net reservoir, we go to the net pay where we uh, integrate and use a, a third type of cutoff, which is the saturation. Why is this important? It's very important in order to uh, identify a very important uh, uh, part when it comes to appraising the field, which is the original oil place equation. So original oil place equation typically is shown on the right-hand side, where there's a, there's a factor, and this factor is multiplied by porosity, one minus SW, which represents the hydrocarbon saturation, multiplied by the area in acres, and then multiplied by H, which is net thickness. This is all divided by beta oil, which is a formation uh, volume factor. So as you can see, <clears throat> three main inputs into this equation, which is typically the H, which is the net thickness, one minus SW, which represents the hydrocarbon saturation, and porosity comes directly from open hole logging interpretation. And this shows why open hole logging is very important. So as I said, we need to start answering a few questions in order to identify if we have a success and we actually would start to develop the field or not. So starting off with shale volume. The first main pillar for a complete and successful formation evaluation is to identify the type of shale as well as identify how much volume of shale that we have. On top of that, we need to identify the type of lithology, whether it's sandstone, dolomite, limestone, as well as uh, resolve the porosity of the reservoir to see the, how much pore spaces that we have which should represent the storage capacity of the reservoir. Once we identify the volumes and the reservoir porosity, we go to the third phase, which is a hydrocarbon saturation, where we identify how much uh, of this pore spaces is actually filled with hydrocarbon and how much is filled with water. Once we identify the saturation into the reservoir, we need to see if this fluid, let's say for example, it, it's, an oil, it's an oil well, how much is movable and how much is bound. And this goes to the fourth uh, type of uh, uncertainty that we need to have and we need to address. 
how much of this fluid is movable and how much of this fluid is bound to the grain, uh, to the grain size. Once we identified the movable fluid, we need to understand the reservoir structure in order to design our completion string. And this typically happens when we uh, acquire wellbore imaging as well as we uh, acquire acoustics in order to understand how the stresses are being distributed into the formation. Once we identify the reservoir structure and, the complete and design the completion, the design the completion, we go to the next step, which is the reservoir pressure points and fluid sampling. And at that time, we start to actually acquire the fluid sample that is downhole at in situ conditions. So by this, we need to take a very close look onto this slide because I'll be going through each and every uh, section. And then at the end, we'll be combining all of these things in order to show uh, a complete set of picture on how to evaluate the reservoir. So starting off with the first uh, part, which is shear volume. So open hole logging suite or open hole logging services uh, are typically divided into different uh, families. Starting off with the nuclear family where we acquire uh, the response of any nuclear, uh, nuclear radioactive material. And uh, this can be divided into uh, a sub four categories, natural, ga natural gamma ray, bulk density, neutron porosity, as well as elemental spectroscopy. The second uh, type of family that we have is resistivity, where we have uh, basically lateral log, uh, which works in uh, water-based mud, induction, which works in oil-based mud, and triaxle, which is a very important uh, type of uh, resistivity uh, tool that we log, and this comes into play when we evaluate laminated sand. The third type of family that we have is the nuclear magnetic resonance, where we identify basically the movable, how much movable fluid that we have into the reservoir. And this would come into play into the third phase of this exercise. And the fourth type of family that we have is acoustics. I'm not talking about just secondary porosity estimation. I'm talking about uh, well bore stability, core pressure prediction, uh, fracture identification, as well as anisotropy. Uh, the fifth type of uh, service that we have is the wellbore imaging and dip meter, where we basically uh, show how, how the formation would look like as if we have taken a core and we uh, see how the formation downhole would uh, look like, as well as see the dipping of the formation itself uh, relative to the north direction. And this is very important when it comes to understanding the structure and understanding the positional environment where the reservoir is actually located. The sixth type of family we have is pressure points and sampling, where we basically acquire the reservoir pressure, identify mobility, as well as acquire fluid sampling at in situ conditions for uh, later analysis, such as PVT, which stands for uh, pressure, volume, and temperature. Finally, we can also acquire sidewall core, and this comes into handy when we uh, try to understand uh, carbonates in specific, because carbonates are very hit, uh, heterogeneous in order to identify how heterogeneous is this reservoir, we need to acquire uh, sidewall cores that can be sent later to the coring lab and uh, do the special core analysis. So typically in open hole logging service, we have uh, almost like seven to eight uh, families. There's one family that's not being mentioned here, which stands for the uh, well bore seismic, but this is just out of the scope of, uh, of the presentation today. But it's worth mentioning that we have uh, an eighth family, which is uh, the uh, well bore seismic, in, seismic acquisition. So starting off with the first family, nuclear. So nuclear gamma ray, natural gamma ray. Basically, uh, a gamma ray tool, how it really works is that we have uh, three main elements into the formation or into the nature that are radioactive by nature, which are potassium, thorium, and uranium. And due to the contribution of potassium, thorium, and uranium, radioactive material or ra these radioactive materials, a gamma ray is being emitted, and this is called a natural gamma ray. When a natural gamma ray uh, is emitted from the formation itself, we have uh, into the tool uh, crystal which basically works when the gamma ray is being uh, emitted from the formation, it falls on the crystal 
So this crystal converts the energy of the gamma ray into um, electrons. These electrons are being multiplied into different dynodes. Dynodes are positively charged. So the reason why this is positively charged is to attract as much as as much as much electrons as we can and also to multiply them in order to see uh, an amplified or a higher signal when it comes to the data processing downhole. So typically what we have is a natural gamma ray being emitted from potassium, thorium, and uranium from the formation. It falls onto the crystal inside the tool. This crystal emits light. The light is contributing or hits the PM tube, which is a photomultiplier tube. And then electrons are being emitted that are being multiplied at different levels. And finally, we get um, a total amplified signal that is proportional to how much energy or how, how, uh, how energetic is this gamma ray. So the more uh, electrons that we have towards the end of this loop, the higher the energy of the gamma ray, the less electrons that we have towards the end of this loop, the lower the energy of the gamma ray. High gamma ray means it's more shaly. A low gamma ray represents a cleaner formation. So how does this work? So basically, as I said, we uh, acquire gamma ray at different depths. And then by looking at the minimum gamma ray and the uh, maximum gamma ray, we can identify where our shale zone and then we can identify our clean zone, which should represent, in this case, a clean sand. And what's in between should represent a shaly sand. Natural gamma ray is very important when it comes to well-to-well -well, well -well correlation, as well as the shale computation or shale volume computation. But shale is a generic name, same as a family. But inside the shale, there are different type of clays. So how do we identify which clay type that we have? For this reason, we developed the spectral gamma ray. So spectral gamma ray works in a different technique where we basically measure the concentration or the ratios of each and every element, typically thorium, potassium, and uranium. And by looking at the ratios uh, of thorium, potassium, and uranium, we can identify the type of clay, such as kaolinite, chlorite, montomorlite, elite. This is very important when it comes to identifying hot sand because typically a hot sand is very rich in feldspar, And if we just rely on the gamma ray, the old gamma ray, we might be mis, uh, misled by the high response of the high gamma ray in this case. So in a hot sand where it's rich in feldspar, due to the uh, radioactive material that we have in the sand, the other gamma ray would read high in count rates which should be, uh, as a first look, uh, identified as shale, but uh, in real life, it's really sand and it's not shale. And this comes into play, uh, especially when you start evaluating uh, basement rocks. So spectral gamma ray uses, as I said, the three ratios, uh, thorium, potassium, and uranium, in order to compute two outputs, which is typically CGR and SGR. So SGR is the submission or the contribution of the three elements, thorium, potassium, and uranium, all combined. This should represent the SGR. And CGR just shows the contribution of thorium and potassium. So whenever we have an overlay between uh, SGR and CGR, we can identify and be 100% sure that it's a clean formation. It's not being... Uh, uh, rich in any radioactive material. And whenever there's a slight separation between CGR and SGR, we know this effect is just coming from uranium and this might be actually misleading when it comes to formation evaluation. So by doing this, by just understanding the natural gamma ray and how the spectral gamma ray works, we can identify the type of um, shale that we have, as well as compute the volume of the shale that, that's there, there present in the reservoir. Now going to the next step, which is the lithology volume and reservoir porosity. So in this case, we have a bulk density and uh, photoelectric factor measurement. What happens in this case is that we actually inject gamma ray uh, into the formation. This gamma ray starts interacting with the uh, rock that is mainly composed of the grain matrix or grain, uh, grain um, particles. Uh, 
and it's also uh, in between their their fluid is actually showing also some contribution uh, due to the interaction between the gamma ray as well uh, to the formation and the fluid we some of the gamma rays are being released and come back to the tool and some of them are being captured where basically they're just uh, stopped and the energy of the gamma ray is very uh, low to reach back to the tool <coughs> excuse me so the gamma rays that are being captured uh, comes into play when we start evaluating the photoelectric uh, factor and when the gamma rays are being uh, uh, emitted from the tool and back to the tool, emitted from the tool into the formation and back to the tool again, this comes into uh, the bulk density computation. So the bulk density computation is primarily focused on or dependent on the Compton scattering where we start to um, emit gamma ray and this gamma ray starts interacting with the formation and then it emits the outermost, uh, the electrons in the outermost shell and then it's being uh, deflected back to the tool. And the, typically the energy range of the gamma ray in this, uh, in this regime is ranging from 75 kilo electron volt to 10 mega electron volt. That's very high. But when the gamma ray are being emitted and then they're being captured, in order for this to happen, we need to knock out the electron that's very close or typically at the innermost shell of the electrons typically very close to the, to, the, to, the neutron, uh, to the neutron and the proton, which is the nucleus. And this acquires a lot of energy in order to overcome and uh, knock out this electron outside. And that's why most of the energy are being utilized and being captured when it, this is happening. And this comes into play when we start uh, detecting what we call the photoelectric absorption, which translates to the photoelectric factor. The energy domain or the energy level at that uh, at that instant is less than 75 kilo electron volt, which is typically very low when it comes to the um, nuclear world, when it comes to uh, gamma ray energies. So <clears throat> bulk density and photoelectric factor is acquired from a single tool. It's a pad tool, as you can see on the left-hand side where we basically have a source, a gamma ray source that emits uh, gamma ray. And then these gamma rays interact with the formation, the fluid, and then comes back, some of the gamma rays come back at the uh, near detector, which is called short space detector. And some of the other gamma rays come at the long space detector, which is far, far ahead from the source itself. Using these two different uh, type of detectors and measurements, we can uh, derive the bulk density or the uh, row B of the formation. Uh, at the same time, since the gamma ray is still being emitted, some of them are being captured and the amount of, uh, or the number of, the number of gamma rays that are being emitted versus the number that's coming back to the, to the tool itself represents how much, uh, how much of this energy has been lost and how much, uh, how much gamma ray has been, um, uh, absorbed, and this would uh, correlate to the PEF measurement, uh, which is the photoelectric factor. Bulk density, uh, formation bulk density comes into play, and it's a very important um, input when it comes to evaluating the type of uh, lithology, as well as uh, estimating the reservoir porosity. PEF, on the other side, is a very good lithology indicator, but just bear in mind, since PEF is very dependent on how much gamma ray are being emitted and the number of, at, number of gamma rays that are being absorbed. It's severely affected by any uh, high gravity solids into the mud system. A typical and a very common uh, um, type of material that really attenuates the PEF measurement is barite. So the presence of barite into the, into the mud severely affects the PEF measurement. And this is something that needs to be taken into consideration while you start looking at the, or having a quick look uh, oversight on the data that you acquire through a triple combo data set. Now going to the uh, third type of nuclear tool that we have or service, uh, which is the neutron porosity. So typically neutrons, in this case, we emit and neutrons at very high energy from the tool using a chemical source or an electronic source, such as a PNG, which is a, 
pulse neutron generator. The energy typically is, at the start of the emission, is very high, and the, as it interacts with the formation as well as the fluid, it starts to rapidly decrease into the energy level until it reaches what we call a thermal state. So this thermal state is the, represents how much or shows uh, how much hydrogen index what we have inside the bore, inside the formation and the reservoir. The, the steeper this drop into the uh, in energy represents more hydrogen index. The more relaxed this uh, energy drop is, the less hydrogen index that we we have in the pore spaces. Uh, the reason is why we emit neutrons and how this is really dependent on hydrogen index is typically uh, through by physics the mass of neutron is equal to the mass of the proton which represents the hydrogen. So uh, hydrogen is an equivalent to the proton and due to the collision between the neutron and the hydrogen, neutron loses a lot of energy until they're being captured in the thermal state. So what happens is that we emit neutron at very high energy. They interact first of all with the pore hole and then they interact with the formation fluid as well as the matrix. And then the neutrons are being captured back onto the different sensors that we have. We have typically two sensors, uh, the short spacing, which is very close to the source and the long spacing, which is a bit far from the source. The reason why we have two detectors and we're not only relying on one detector is that the near detector is primarily uh, attenuated or affected by the borehole condition, such as washouts or hole rugosity as well as the borehole fluid. But if we have another detector that's far ahead from the uh, source itself, then it reads more deep inside the formation and it's less being affected by the borehole condition and it's actually seeing what is there inside the formation. Using these two different measurements from these two different sensors, we're trying to correct for any borehole condition or effect that might be affecting the uh, final output of the neutron porosity. So slowing down the rate is proportional to the hydrogen index. As I said before, the, we started very high energy and the rate of um, slowing down, the, how much time it takes to slow down the neutron to reach the thermal state is proportional to the hydrogen index. So hydrogen index is a quantity which should represent uh, how much hydrogen we have per unit volume. Uh, the more hydrogen we have, the, the, the faster this energy would uh, slow, would, 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 uh, the slowing down rate of the neutron would be higher. The less hydrogen we have into the borehole, the, uh, the, the slowing down rate would be uh, very, very slow compared to high hydrogen index. Uh, since uh, hydrogen index or neutron porosity is primarily affected by the presence of hydrogen, which is the proton, then we say that neutron porosity measures the total porosity, which in this case, it measures any hydrogen that's, come, that's there in front of the tool, whether it's coming from water, gas, or oil. So how do we um, uh, interpret the neutron porosity and the bulk density in order to, to resolve the type of fluid, uh, the, sorry, the type of lithology, as well as the reservoir porosity. So typically we plot uh, what we call um, uh, a composite plot, where it typically combines different measurements. For example, in this case, we're combining gamma ray in the first track, as well as the caliper. And then the uh, this second track represents the bulk density and the neutron porosity. So just by looking at the neutron porosity and the bulk density, we need to make sure that we have the right uh, formation type and the right compatible scale. So typically a compatible scale is something that's being used in order to show a good visualization on how the neutron porosity and the bulk density would respond to each other. And just by looking at the uh, plot itself, we can identify where there's an, um, uh, an overlap. For instance, it might represent uh, water. If whenever there is a separation between neutron porosity and the bulk density, it would represent uh, gas. And, um, and the same goes also for oil with uh, less separation. So what happens here is that we look at the gamma ray first, whereas there's, when there is low gamma ray, so typically low gamma ray is around this area as well as at the top of the reservoir, as well as at the top of this log. Uh, 
So we are expecting to have a clean formation in this reservoir, and this, go, this leads us to go and look at the neutron porosity and the bulk density. So typically, uh, when these tools were calibrated and they were designed, they were designed in a limestone matrix that was water-filled. So whenever there is a limestone matrix, there is limestone downhole into the reservoir, and it's water-filled, all the points, let's say, for example, if it's, a, if it's a limestone in this case, everything should be lying on this line. But if it's a sandstone uh, matrix and it's a sandstone formation that's water filled, all the points should be lying on the uh, second line or the first line. And if the um, uh, formation is dolomite and it's rich with water filled or rich uh, with water, then it should be typically uh, lying on the dolomite line. So let's have a look how this would work. This is a cross plot between bulk density, which is rho b, and neutral porosity, which is uh, n phi. So what we do is typically uh, plot the curves that we have from the neutral porosity and the bulk density from the data set that we have, in this case, which is a triple combo. We plot these data onto the cross plot. And we see how these points would fall onto these uh, different trend lines, dolomite, calcite, and quartz. So first of all, any water filled, as I said, the tools were built in, in limestone uh, formation that was water filled. So typically I should be expecting an overlap when there is uh, limestone into the formation and it's water filled. Provided that we're using the correct compatible scale. In this case, the compatible scale is ranging from 0.3 to minus 0.1. Later, we plot the other part, which is um, shows a separation between neutron porosity and bulk density. And this is typically a very good uh, uh, signature for gas presence. The more separation that we have between neutron porosity and bulk density, the more gas that we have. And this is typically called the balloon effect. So as I said, since this is limestone, if it was water filled, it should have line over this, uh, this trend line. But since due to, the, due to the presence of gas, now the hydrogen index is typically lower in gas compared to water. And that's why the points start to deviate and move towards the top, where we typically expect to have lower porosity since the total porosity is dependent on the hydrogen index and gas has a low hydrogen index, as well as uh, have uh, low or like uh, less dense material uh, or bulk volume since gas is less dense by nature compared to any fluid. So typically uh, gas, any points in the gas or any gas in the formation would start to deviate from these three different lines all the way to the top uh, towards this region. <laughs> All right, so um, now going to the dolomite. When we plotted the dolomite that was water filled into the cross plot, they became uh, over the overlay onto the dolomite line, which is mainly uh, showing a dolomite uh, formation that's water filled since it's falling on this dolomite line. And then finally, when we are plotting uh, shale, which is being presented by the high gamma ray, shale always fall towards the uh, right bottom side of this uh, cross plot. The reason is that shale is considered more dense, a little bit more dense because of the amount of bound fluid that it uh, contains, as well as the high porosity or high pore spaces neutral porosity, because typically shale is very rich with water and the more water we have into the shale, the more the hydrogen index, which should represent uh, a more or a, an increase in neutron porosity. So shale typically is lying over this uh, re region of the cross plot between neutron porosity and bulk density. Finally, uh, when we're looking at uh, salt, such as sulfur, uh, anhydrite, or um, uh, any other um, salt material or formation, uh, a, very good, uh, a very good response for sulfur or salt or anhydrite is that it's, they all share a common uh, behavior, which is a very low porosity. It's almost like zero. So anything that is uh, zero porosity should be considered as anhydrite or salt, unless we have a different type of measurement that confirms it might be a tight 
sand or tight carbonate. But for simplicity now, we need to just uh, assume that we're dealing with uh, porous sand or porous carbonate. But just bear in mind, if we have tight sand and tight carbonate, we would be expecting something around this area. So it should also show zero porosity, but due to the difference in density, for example, anhydrite is very dense, it's almost around three. And uh, salt and sulfur is like around 2.05. So the key differentiator in this case is uh, the bulk density, the true bulk density of the formation itself. If we have a tight sand or a tight carbonate, we'd be expecting zero porosity to fall around this, this zone or this, or this zone in case of sand, but the bulk density would change in exam, for example, for sandstone, it would be reading around 2.65 typically, uh, limestone to around 2.71. So as you can see, by just looking at the neutron porosity and the bulk density, we can come up with different idea or a, a more, a more insight of the type of lithology that we have, whether it's dolomite, limestone, sandstone. Uh, if we have a water-filled sandstone or we have a gas-filled sandstone, and also if we can, uh, we can also identify uh, through the high gamma ray and the neutron porosity, as well as the bulk density, if we have a shear effect. There's one thing that needs to be also highlighted here is that uh, you see there's are like um, red dotted lines or circles where you can see the, these lines are being broken down into different compartments. So it starts from zero, five, 10, 15, 20, 25, et cetera. These represents the uh, estimated, or let's say uh, initial guess of the reservoir porosity. So just by relying on the neutron porosity itself, it is very, it's, it's, it's a very critical part that needs to be taken care of because it's misleading when you try to evaluate the reservoir. And that's why we need to use different independent measurements in order to derive and see the effect of the actual uh, lithology as well as the fluid and identify the um, reservoir porosity. So in this case, for example, for this zone, the points are lying on the limestone line and if we look at the data cluster, it will be falling around the 20 PU. So this shows that it's a limestone matrix that's water filled and the average porosity of the reservoir is around 20% PU. Uh, another case is uh, a limestone um, matrix at the bottom where we have another, temp we have the same trend, limestone water filled, but the porosity is reading around 10 PU. And this can be applied to dolomite, limestone, and sandstone. But what if we have a complex reservoir? So this uh, other approach works perfectly fine when we have a uh, shady sand sequence or we have um, uh, a dolomite or carbonate, pure carbonate or pure dolomite. Uh, but it's, it's very tricky when we have a combo of these different elements combined like sand, shale, dolomite, anhydrite, and uh, sometimes pyrite. So the more, the complex the reservoir gets, the, the, the different technology we need to use in order to derive the lithology that we have. And this comes into play when we have the elemental spectroscopy. So element, elemental spectroscopy is basically dependent on the neutrons uh, that are being emitted from the tool. So we have a neutron tool that emits neutron at very, very high energy. Uh, it uses an uh, uh, electronic source, what we call the PNG, uh, for, um, pulse neutron generator. And this uh, neutrons interact with the formation, and due to the interaction with the formation, um, the induced gamma rays are being emitted, and they come back to the tool. So what we, what we typically happen is that we emit very high energy interaction with the neutrons, uh, sorry, with the formation and the liquid. Due to the interaction with the liquid and the formation, induced gamma rays are being emitted from, the, from whatever the tool is actually in contact with, and this induced gamma rays come back to the tool. The induced gamma rays detect and can be broken down into uh, what we call uh, spectrums. So the first type of spectrum that we have is the inelastic spectrum, and the second type of the uh, spectrum that we have is capture. Inelastic, from the word itself, it the neutrons uh, hit the, um, the, the nucleus of the matrix or the fluid, and then it bounces back and comes back or emits uh, gamma ray that are being coming back with a certain signature. 
the capture spectrum is is a bit different where we basically uh, emit neutron and then due to this interaction they lose energy and due to this lost energy they start to absorb and being captured by the elements and then the capture elements start to uh, emit uh, a signature gamma ray that are being collected back to the tool. By analyzing the two different types of spectrums, the inelastic spectrum and the capture spectrum, we're able to measure more than 22 or 21 elements that are present in the Earth crust. And this can, uh, can solve more than 99% of the elements that's, that's there present in the Earth crust. <coughs> this is very important when it comes to uh, analyzing unconventional reservoir or uh, complex uh, lithologies that might we have in, uh, for example, in uh, here in Egypt, the Gulf of Suez. So it comes into play uh, because we can uh, accurately measure the clay volume directly from the tool, and then we can solve the uh, sand, pyrite, uh, dolomite, limestone, and dolomite. And this is uh, very important when it comes to uh, a proper uh, formation evaluation because the more accurate the volumes that we have, the better the estimation of the porosity. And this would uh, affect severely the oil in place equation calculation when it comes to reserves estimation. Another uh, element that we also measure is what we call uh, carbon. So carbon is typically found in any carbon rich material. Some of them can be organic carbon and some of them can be inorganic carbon. So organic carbon are typically anything like oil, bitumen, kerogen, gas, light oil. And inorganic carbon typically comes from the chemical composition of uh, different elements of different lithologies, such as uh, calcium carbonate, which is limestone, uh, calcium magnesium carbonate, which is the dolomite, citrite, etc. So what we typically happen is that we measure the total carbon that's coming into the tool and then we remove the effect of any uh, inorganic carbon, and the remaining is the total organic carbon. This comes into play, and it's very important and very helpful when it comes to unconventional reservoir evaluation, typically um, in the U.S. land, uh, where they have a lot of unconventional bays. <coughs> so by doing this, we have primarily identified the shale volume using gamma ray and natural gamma ray, and then we have identified the type of matrix that can that that might be there present in the formation, such as sandstone, limestone, dolomite. Uh, even if it's a complex reservoir, we can start using uh, spectroscopy measurement where we can derive the lithology directly from the tool, and also get an estimate of the total porosity of the reservoir. Now it's important to uh, go to the next phase, which is hydrocarbon saturation. So typically, uh, hydrocarbon saturation is computed using resistivity. Uh, so we have typically two type of resistivity uh, families. We have lateral log and induction. So lateral log works uh, in uh, water-based mode, where we basically have an, a tool that has an, um, an electrode that emits a very high um, output of current. This current is being injected into the formation. The deeper the, the current goes into the formation, the more depth investigation that we have. And the shorter the current would go into the formation, the less depth investigation we have. Typically, a lateral log is a five output. So it has uh, RLA1, or let's say uh, the shallowest resistivity is the one that's very close to the borehole all the way up to uh, RLA5, which is a lateral log at the depth level of five. And this is the deepest uh, resistivity that can be uh, measured. And this should be representing the RT, which is the true formation resistivity of the reservoir. Uh, this is uh, happening at multiple frequencies in order to uh, inject current. So uh, from physics, voltage is equal to I times R, which represents current times resistance. We know the current that we're injecting into the formation and we measure the voltage drop between each and every point, in each, each and every point at each uh, different depth of investigation. So this means that we can uh, uh, compute or measure the resistivity using the very simple equation, V is equal to IR, voltage is equal to current times resistance. The second type of um, uh, 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 tool that we have is that further elaborate on this, 
uh, as I said, we emit very high uh, current output that goes into deep into the formation, and they're being detected at multiple uh, receivers across the tool uh, body. Uh, due to this uh, interaction, we can estimate and uh, measure the um, current or the resistivity at each and every investigation. And by measuring the voltage drop, we can see um, and uh, uh, compute the resistivity of the formation. This is a very good example where we start to see the differences and see the um, azimuthal um, response from the resistivity curve. So in this case, in this case, we have what we call LLD, which represents the very deep resistivity response coming from the deep part of the reservoir, which should be the uninvaded zone, version zone. LLS is the um, uh, shallow resistivity, and LHR is the uh, azimuth resistivity. So by just looking at the resistivity curves on the log, uh, on the log view, it's a logarithmic scale, we can see, uh, first of all, where we can identify where is our uh, high resistivity, and this should be contributing uh, typically to our hydrocarbon zone, but it might be misleading sometimes when we have fresh water. So fresh water is typically less, uh, it has less chlorides, uh, NaCl, and NaCl, since it has a chlorine atom, uh, it has a chloride anion, it's uh, um, the more chlorides we have into the water, the more saline, which means the less resistive, and vice versa. The less chlorides we have into the formation water, the, um, the higher the resistivity of the formation, formation water, and therefore the more resistive. So sometimes we might be uh, uh, misled uh, by just looking on the resistivity itself uh, and as on detecting or trying to understand if it's a, a hydrocarbon bearing zone or not. So uh, for simplicity, we'll be just looking at this and assuming that the high resistivity would represent a hydrocarbon presence and the low resistivity would be presenting uh, something like uh, water in this case. By just looking at the contrast between the low resistivity and the high resistivity, we can identify easily where is our, or typically we can say that the, our pay zone is supposed to be across the clean gamma ray as well as the high resistivity, but it also, it's also uh, worth, uh, worth the importance to look at the uh, neutron porosity. Because sometimes if we have a tight truck uh, where we have very low, uh, small pore spaces, uh, typically in uh, um, tight sand or tight carbonate, we might have a, a high resistivity profile. And this is typically happening because the uh, neutron porosity since it's dependent on the hydrogen index, the less pore spaces that we have, the less hydrogen index that we have per unit volume or per unit truck, and therefore uh, it will be reading uh, almost uh, zero porosity. So this zero porosity, think of it as if it's a solid. Solids, if they don't have liquid inside them, they would not uh, easily uh, uh, conduct electricity. And this is typically, and this typically happens when we have tight sand. So in order to come up with a better visualization, we need to look at different uh, independent measurements together in order to come up with uh, a better insight of what we, what we have there downhole in the soft surface. So we identify low gamma ray, and then we go from low gamma ray, look at the resistivity profile, identify where there's uh, high resistivity and there is low resistivity, which is typically water. We can use also a baseline in order to just look at this visually. And then we just, uh, in order to, uh, to properly or like to be a little bit certain about the hydrocarbon presence, we also need to look at the neutron porosity as well as the bulk density. The second family or the second group of uh, resistivity we have is induction. So induction works in a different way. Induction works in oil-based mud. So in an oil-based mud, since we have oil into the borehole, uh, if we have a current being emitted from the tool, the current would not flow into the formation uh, since it's uh, being uh, um, uh, was, uh, um, stopped or it's, it's not being penetrating through the formation due to the non-conductive medium that we, the tool is being run. And the reason is we developed an induction tool is that we use a different technique. So primary, it starts with a transmitter. It has a transmitter array and a receiver array. The transmitter array, it has a coil where we start to inject current into the coil inside the tool, 
uh, due to this injected current, a magnetic field, a primary magnetic field, is being built across this first coil. The magnetic field of the coil inside the tool in the transmitter array intersects or um, it comes over the ground loop, what we call, which is the formation, the ground loop. And this ground loop, we would create another magnetic field into the formation itself. This magnetic field would intersect or would uh, come into uh, contact with the receiver array inside the tool tube. And this uh, uh, magnetic field would start to in emit and uh, start to measure an electronic response, an electric response in the tool. So basically, we're not injecting current inside the borehole. We're injecting current inside the coils in the transmitter array and the receiver array. The current that's being emitted in the transmitter array, they go into the loop, generate a magnetic field. This magnetic field inside the tool um, interacts with the ground loop, which is typically the formation. And the formation, uh, they will generate a secondary magnetic field. The secondary magnetic field interacts with the receiver coil inside the tool. When the magnetic field from the secondary magnetic field interacts with the coil in the receiver array, an electric current is being generated. The more current we have generated inside the receiver coil, the less, uh, the, the, the more the signal is, the, the more signal that we have on the receiver, uh, receiver coil, the um, uh, higher the resistivity. The less signal that we have, the less the resistivity. So as I said before, we do this at uh, different depth investigation. In this case, it's also five depth investigation where we acquired uh, or we uh, induced this uh, magnetic fields at different uh, frequencies. And we uh, look at the separation between the resistivity, whether in lateral log or induction, in order to understand uh, how permeable the zone is. So typically when there is a separation between the shallow, medium and the deep uh, resistivity, it's a very good indicator when we have a permeable zone. The, the more the data are stacked or uh, they're superimposed or overlaying to, to each other, uh, shallow, deep, and medium, the, the less uh, permeable the zone. Another output also that comes out from the resistivity is the very deep resistivity. Typically, in this case, it's uh, AT90. Uh, so AT90, which is the green line here, it's like almost seven, seven and a half feet inside the formation, which is very deep. So it's less likely to be affected by the invasion. And we start with 10, 20 inch, 10 inches, 20 inches, 30 inches, 60, as well as 90. So typically we assume the 90 inch is the true formation resistivity, which is RT. And this is very important to identify in order to compute uh, hydrocarbon saturation when we come to this uh, step uh, later during this presentation. So, what, but what happens in, in, in thin beds? So typically if we have a clean big sand and big shale, big shale body and big sand body, the response is more or less uh, visualized and can be easily captured through the tool itself, whether it's a tear lock or induction. But when it comes to thin lamination sand, and this is very typical when it comes to evaluating um, lithology, especially here in the Nile Delta, the old approach, whether it's lateral log or the induction, does not really work well. And this is a very good example. We would see the response of, the, of these formation uh, very, very low. And this can be mis misleading sometimes when it comes to formation evaluation. And that's why we need to really measure a different um, uh, type of resistivity, which is called the triaxle. So triaxle is also an induction tool. Uh, but instead of having uh, one receiver and one transmitter, we have uh, res transmitters at different axes, uh, X, Y, and Z, and receivers at X, Y, and Z in order to uh, measure the, the, the signal at a different azimuth, azimuthal measurement. And by doing the full resistivity tensor, which is um, um, uh, an algorithm that's being done into the tool itself, we can start to re resolve for two things called RV and RH. RH, which represents the horizontal resistivity, and RV is called the vertical resistivity. So RV and RH, think of it as um, uh, instead of having a um, uh, series circuit. So series circuit, if we need to identify the total resistance in a series circuit, we need to 
just have a summation of R1 plus R2 plus R3, etc. But if we have um, a laminated sand, think of it as a parallel circuit. So for identifying um, uh, the total resistance in a par parallel circuit, we use one over R is equal to uh, one over R1 plus one over R2. So by identifying the tensor, uh, full tensor uh, resistivity, and by looking at the signal coming from the different azimuth, X, Y, and Z, whether coming from the transmitter or the receiver array, we can come up with the RH and RV. Using this RV and RH, we develop or we plot it using uh, something called a tornado plot, where typically we plot the RV and RH. And using the shape point as an indicator, we can identify what we have as a final output for RV and RH. And this is a very typical practice when it comes to laminated sand. So in this case, it's, a, it's an example where you can see gamma ray, high gamma ray, low gamma ray. So this low gamma ray is easy to identify. And just looking at the RT, low gamma ray, neutron density, and uh, just basic evaluation, you can identify this is just the pay zone. But when we looked at the image, the well bore imaging, there was actually thin laminations that are being detected by the image as well as the NMR uh, nuclear magnetic resonance. When we resolved RV and RH, you can see initially, if we were just really dependent on the RT itself, we would see a very lax response, very low resistivity that would be misleading when it comes to formation evaluation. But when we resolve RV and RH, we can start to see that the vertical, the vertical resistivity is a bit higher compared to what we see in the RT. And this, when they were tested, this came out to be producible and it added uh, another pay zone that was previously missed just due to the fact that we were just relying on the RT itself. So in this case, the sand, the, the sand or like the major sand body was already identified by the uh, conventional uh, lateral log, which is RT. But uh, using the RV and RH, using the triaxial resistivity, we're able to add more pay into the reservoir through the thin bed laminations that were evident initially on NMR and images, and they were backed up by the RV when the RV, when the RV and RH computation was done. If this was not uh, available, this pay zone would be still there, but they would be overlooked, and this would represent an, ex an example of a bypassed way. So as I said, in order to, um, uh, to resolve for saturation, we need to understand and look closely onto the resistivity. So what happens, what really happens into the, um, into the basic formation evaluation or quick look is that we look at the plain, plain body, plain gamma ray. And then I said, we look at the resistivity, we identify where there's high resistance and low resistance. Typically we'll be assuming high resistance for simplicity at this, in this level, that high resistance would represent hydrocarbon and low resistivity would represent uh, water. And once we identify where is our uh, high resistive zone, we just go cross check the neutron density and uh, neutron bulk density in order to see the separation between them in order to identify, for example, gas, oil, and then typically water the points or like the data, neutron porosity and the bulk density should be overlaying. So by just doing this quick look evaluation, we can start uh, in, uh, like, uh, punching the numbers into this basic saturation equation, which is typically the Archie's equation. So Archie's equation is SW, which is saturation of water, is equal to the nth square uh, of A, which is the empirical, for, empirical constant, uh, typically assumed as one, multiplied by RW, which represents the, R, the resistivity of water um, at a, me a measured temperature uh, downhole. And then it's divided by phi raised to the power of m, which is the porosity of the reservoir raised to the cementation exponent that's usually uh, estimated or assumed as, as two. And then we have RT, that's the deep resistivity that we can directly get from the tools itself, whether it's uh, AT90 in case of induction or RV in case of um, uh, thin bit laminations or RLA5 in case of lateral log. So by doing this, we can start to estimate and compute how much hydro water saturation that we have. And using the SW, uh, we can subtract one minus SW in order to get what's remaining, which should be contributing to the hydrocarbon, whether it's oil or gas. But the question is, how do we get RW? So RW, typically, we can get it from different methods, but the most common method 
if we have a water zone, we go to the water zone and then uh, using the RCS equation by taking a log to both sides. So taking log to this side and the log to the other side, we can derive um, uh, this basic equation by assuming SW is equal to one. So it's log RT is equal to minus M log five plus log ARW. So if you have a closer look at this uh, equation, it represents um, what we call uh, equation of straight line. So where we have Y is equal to MX, which M represents the slope and X is the, um, is the independent measurement or independent measurement in this case. And uh, Y is the intercept. Uh, as I said before, A is assumed to be one. So typically this is just log RW which means in order to transform this into a, a, an equation of a straight line and plot it, we need to plot it on a log-log scale. So what we plot is the log RT, this is log-log scale. We plot RT on the y-axis and phi on the x-axis. And the slope would represent the, um, uh, what we call the M and the point of intercept, which typically happens at, y, at log phi equal to zero, would represent the RW. And this is only applicable when we have a water zone. So we made two assumptions. First of all, we made an assumption to uh, A, which, which is equal to one. And then we went to the water zone, assumed that it's 100% water filled and there's no residual oil or there's no oil in this, uh, in this part of the reservoir. And then we plot the points and based on the slope itself, we can uh, slope and intercept, we can assume the RW. This is the first approach. In case if we don't have, um, uh, a clear water body into the reservoir, it might be found somewhere a little bit deep or a little bit shallow. It's still applicable, but it's not the best approach. Still, people use it in the industry, but uh, this is just provided that they don't have a water zone near or inside the reservoir that they have. But just bear in mind that if you have a look and uh, you just see the, um, uh, the TVD section of the reservoir, which is the two vertical depth of the reservoir, if the zones are pretty close together, let's say like um, 100 meters, uh, 50 meters away, the resistivity of the RW would still be um, a good approach or a good starting point. But just bear in mind, it's not the best approach. The only uh, valid or let's say like the only best uh, uh, technical approach to estimate RW is to collect a fluid sample from downhole. Uh, water, uh, water sample, send it to the lab and just measure the RW uh, at, the, at the lab itself. And then you can just uh, input this uh, RW into the uh, saturation equation that you're using, for example, in this case, which is RC equation. So back to this equation. So since we have RW, whether it's coming from the picket plot, which is the one that I was discussing a bit, uh, uh, a bit earlier today, <clears throat> or whether you have a direct input coming from uh, a measured uh, water sample collected downhole and being sent to the lab, we can uh, have the first uh, input into this equation. We have E as one, we have porosity uh, using the cross plots between the neutron porosity and the bulk density. We have M assumed as two, N is also assumed as two, and RT coming directly from the tool, AT90, RLA5 or RV, then we can uh, start to calculate SW at each and every point of the reservoir and then uh, we subtract SW from one in order to compute how much hydrocarbon saturation that we have in place. Since uh, we identify the hydrocarbon saturation uh, after identifying the volumes that we have, we need to now identify how much fluid is movable, how much water is movable, how much oil is movable and how much gas is movable. In order to do this, we need to look at NMR, NMR data. So NMR is a nuclear magnetic resonance where we basically <coughs> have a magnetic uh, field being generated or being uh, induced into the formation through the tool. So we have a permanent magnet in the tool that um, emits a magnetic field, a constant magnetic field and pulsed magnetic field. Uh, this magnetic field would orient the hydrogen index into the space so when the magnetic field, the permanent magnetic field is being uh, in contact with the hydrogen index, they start to spin into the vertical direction, in this direction. And then we have a pulse uh, magnetic field that's being uh, also emitted from the tool. Uh, 
and this would orient or flip the hydrogen index from the vertical axis to the horizontal axis. The time the hydrogen would take from this horizontal axis all the way back to the vertical axis represents the what we call the NMR measurement, which is the um, relaxation time. By measuring this relaxation time, we measure how much the amplitude is coming back to the tool and the time it takes. Typically, the more hydrogen we have inside the reservoir, the more the amplitude would be and the longer the time, the less hydrogen index, then, then we have a, a lower amplitude and less time. So the area under the curve would represent what we call, once we invert this amplitude time domain to what we call a T2 distribution, is the, this uh, kind of distribution. The area under this uh, shaded curve or a shaded area, the green line in the green area would represent the storage capacity of the reservoir. And this is um, a lithology independent porosity. By looking at this uh, spectrum of T2 distribution, we can identify um, multiple things into the reservoir when it comes to move, move, movability of the fluid. First of all, by looking at the very high peak towards the later time of T2, we can identify the free fluid porosity and how much free fluid that we have into the pore space. By looking at the shorter uh, T2, which typically comes at a very short T2 distribution around 0 0.3 to 3 to almost like 10 microsecond, we can identify how much bound fluid that we have. This bound fluid can be divided, subdivided into small pores, small pore spaces or small pores, as well as the capillary bound. So capillary bound, typically they will not flow and they're just very hard to flow. Uh, small pores comes into play when we identify and start to look at um, um, uh, tight, uh, tight lithologies uh, such as uh, tight sand or tight carbonate. So by just looking at this T2 distribution, that's an output from the NMR measurement, we can identify and easily identify and see how much uh, bound fluid we have versus how much free fluid. The free fluid would contribute to the uh, uh, movable fluid that's easy to move. So typically what would happen is that once we perforate, typically anything in front of this, uh, in front of this zone would easily flow. And anything, if we have a lot of this into the reservoir that we have, then it needs uh, further stimulation in order to start producing the, the reservoir and put it in production. So there are different applications for neutron, for NMR or neutron magnetic resonance. So as I said, first of all, it provides a lithology independent porosity. So you can just use this porosity and compare it directly to the core. Uh, they just show a one-to-one -one correlation. It's a very good thing when once we don't have a core uh, core data acquired or being uh, taken from the well, and we need to estimate the core porosity. And this is a very good and very representable uh, storage capacity when it comes to formation evaluation, which is the NMR porosity. Uh, second thing is identifying the pore spaces that we have, how much, uh, how, how big the pore spaces are. The bigger the pore spaces, the more it would lie towards the higher end of the T2 distribution. The smaller the pore spaces, the more it would lie towards the left-hand side of the T2 distribution. So the more this peak comes to the right, it represents more free fluid and more big, like more pore spaces. The more this peak would come towards this side of this uh, T2 distribution, it would represent um, small pore spaces and more bound fluid. And it's also worth mentioning that another application of um, <clears throat> of uh, NMR is that uh, estimating the irreducible water saturation. Since we can identify easily how much movable fluid that we have, we can also identify the irreducible water saturation when it comes to uh, <coughs> understanding <coughs> what would be the residual uh, water into the formation in order to estimate the water cut for the reservoir when it comes to production. <coughs> Since we are measuring uh, the NMR porosity, it's also worth mentioning that we can derive and uh, uh, compute uh, two types of permeability equations, uh, SDR and uh, timor -Pots. These as These permeability curves can be a very huge input when it comes to <coughs> uh, understanding the facies that we have into the uh, reservoir. So typically what a reservoir engineer would like to, would like to have is, uh, would like, they would like to have a poor, uh, porosity, 
the reservoir porosity, plotted versus uh, permeability, whether this permeability is coming from a correlation that they have developed in the field, or a measurement that's being acquired through a log or a service, or another type of source of permeability can be the core permeability. But core permeability is a bit expensive. It's quite expensive to do uh, NMR, uh, permeability estimation in, into a full bulk core. And that's why um, most of the clients, they would prefer to run NMR or if they have a very solid knowledge onto the field and the facies of the field does not really change a lot, then they can just develop a permeability equation that they can use later in order to derive permeability. Using the permeability and the porosity, the reservoir would, a reservoir engineer would start to uh, classify the reservoir into facies. Let's say uh, clean sand, silty, silty facies, uh, shady sand, sandy shale, in order for them to better assign their field and reservoir properties when it comes to um, um, uh, dynamic simulation and uh, when they change the static model to a dynamic model. <clears throat> Here's an example of how NMR is actually uh, showing a comparison between how much bound fluid and how much free fluid. So this right, uh, this very right track it shows the T2 distribution that was shown before. By just looking at the um, uh, T2 distribution, the points or like the, the peaks are coming actually at the very late part of the T2 distribution, which should be just directly looking at this, estimating that or like assuming that this is uh, free fluid compared to another case when we have uh, most of the peaks coming towards the shorter time, time window of the T2 distribution uh, towards the early stage of the T2, which shows more bound fluid. So this is just as a quick indication uh, while logging, you can just, uh, while real time uh, QCing the job, you can identify if this reservoir is actually uh, bearing water, bearing bearing the fluid, and how much of this fluid can be moved. So just by just barely looking at these two distributions, I can say this is a bad reservoir, and it needs further simulation to be produced if there is hydrocarbon, and this is a good reservoir that can be easily produced just right after perforation. So now we've identified almost. Um, 60% uh, of the reservoir evaluation. So we started with shale volume, computation, lithology, and as well as porosity. And then we went to saturation or hydrocarbon saturation. And then we identified how much of this fluid can be movable just looking at the NMR and uh, looking at the permeability. Now it's time to look at the reservoir structure and the completion design. So acoustics. Acoustics is primarily uh, focused once we emit an um, and a, a waveform, or we emit uh, a sonic waveform that's being emitted from the transmitter, it vibrates. The as, it, as the transmitter vibrates, it keeps propagating into the formation, into the borehole fluid, and then it comes into the formation, and then at a certain angle, it starts to deflect back and it goes back to the receiver. Once we get the um, signal back to the receiver, we can start to measure three main uh, outputs of acoustics, which are typically compressional slowness, shear slowness, and stony slowness. So compressional comes, uh, compressional slowness comes very, uh, at a very high or like very, very short time after emitting the transmitter, followed by shear and then followed by stone. So a typical response, if we have the three, uh, three signals coming from the formation, is that we get the compressional arrival first, and then we get later in time the shear arrival, and then a little bit later in time after shear, we get the stony. So it goes compressional, shear, and stony. But how the waveforms really propagates into the formation. So in case of a compressional, think of it as if you have a hammer and you just keep knocking on the matrix itself. So the waveform propagation is actually going down into the, uh, down into the lithology or the formation itself. But for shear, we're actually knocking onto the lithology from the left-hand side to the right-hand side from the sideways, and we're just bending the formation as if it's like looking like a snake in this case. So for compressional, the waveform propagation goes from up till down, and for uh, shear wave, it also goes up and down, but in this case, the waveform also goes into an S shape, let's say, and it just keeps moving the particles into this direction instead of compressing the particles in this direction. 
So compressional, from the word itself, it compresses the formation, it squeezes the formation itself. Shear, as if we're just breaking the formation, we're just trying to knock the formation and try to break it down into different layers. So as I said, we have a transmitter that at time zero, at uh, the beginning of the transmission itself, it starts to emit uh, a pulse, a wave, that keeps going into the um, mud, and that's why we have a mud wave. As the mud wave itself interacts with the borehole wall, in this case, in, at time microsecond, 70 microsecond, we start to have a refracted compressional and refracted shear. So as I said, uh, the compressional, would, since they would reach faster, this means it's ahead of shear. So shear is a bit late and compression is a bit faster. And then once we reach what we call a critical angle, then we get head waves. So a head wave, the compressional head wave would start to go back to the tool faster. And that's why we measure it uh, faster in time compared to the shear because shear will be taking a little bit more time to go back to the tool. So this is typically what happens into the uh, sonic or acoustics acquisition when it comes to uh, transmitter and arrays. So we have a transmitter that emits um, very high energy uh, pulses. They travel through the uh, borehole fluid and then they interact with the borehole uh, wall. Once this, is, when this interaction happens, they start to get refracted, refracted compression and refracted shear. Once these waveforms or once these signals reach the critical angle, they come back again to the receiver and that's how we detect uh, compressional slowness, shear slowness, as well as um, stony slowness. So for this to happen, we need to have different receivers at different depth investigations. So typically the, the greater the distance between the transmitter and the receiver, the more depth investigation the tool would cover, the less the distance between the receiver and the transmitter, the shorter the depth investigation. So we're really interested into, into getting the more signal coming from the deep receiver, but we are also uh, uh, bound by anything that comes into the borehole due to the effect of mud or borehole rugosity. And that's why we need to, multi to, need to measure at multiple depth investigation in order to remove the effect of the borehole as well as the mud. So as I said, in time domain, the compressional would arrive first, and then later in time, the shear head wave would arrive later. And then to, after a certain period of time after shear, we get the stony. So we, what, what typically happens is that we need to combine all these measurements since they're coming at different detectors, detector one, receiver one, receiver two, receiver three, four, five, six, seven, eight, in order to measure and get the final output of stony uh, slowness or shear slowness or compression slowness, we need to do what we call STC processing. So STC stands for time, uh, slowness time coherence, where we basically plot time versus coherence. Coherence is the data density, which is typically in red. The red, the color, the higher the confidence in the signal. The blue, the color, the less uh, confidence that we have in the signal. So we plot coherence versus time and also versus slowness. As I said, in terms of time domain and slowness domain, we should be expecting in terms of slowness and time, we should be expecting compressional, shear, and then stony, later in time and also later in terms of slowness. So this cross plot or this snapshot is if, is if, is if uh, you're looking at this um, uh, histogram or like let's say uh, uh, view of this uh, coherence time slowness from the top side. So if we look at from this top side, we're looking at the time versus slowness, which should be representing this. The bigger the amplitude of these peaks, the more the bright spots will be, which is typically in this case, uh, red spots, which shows high confidence. The less peaks we have here around this area, then we have these blue spots. So by just looking at this coherence map, we can identify the compressional slowness, which is in this case, for example, it's reading around 60 microseconds per foot. And then we can identify the shear slowness, which is reading around like 105 microseconds per foot, which is in this case. And then later in time, we can identify the shear slowness, which is around 200 or 190 microseconds per foot. And we just do this for each and every depth in order to come up with what we see typically when it comes to array acoustic waveform.
This is just the basics of acoustics. So these are the main pillars when it comes to the advanced applications of acoustics. In order to do these advanced applications, we need to properly measure compressional, shear, and stoning. So a very good application when it comes to uh, acoustics is understanding the borehole geology, understanding if we have bedding, if we have fractures, if we have breakouts to the formation that can be correlated and can be integrated with the well bore image. So this is a very good example application when it comes to carbonate evaluation, for example. Another good example when it comes to geomechanics, when we're trying to predict the drilling, uh, uh, drilling new structures or estimating the pore pressure prediction for drilling the well, and designing where to perforate and how to perforate, understanding the stresses inside the well bore. And then we can use this in order to come up with a mechanical earth model that can be used by the geomechanics engineer in order to develop uh, a full picture of the stresses, stress regimes, as well as design how to complete the uh, well later during production. So in this case, I'll, in this presentation, I'll be just going briefly over geomechanics and well bore uh, geology. There are a bunch of other applications such as rock physics when it comes to fluid substitution, uh, when it comes to uh, inversion of the um, seismic. And then there's another application when you develop synthetic seismogram, when we have, uh, when we try to up and uh, um, enhance our uh, surface seismic data using the borehole acoustics by driving synthetic seismogram. And typically, a uh, uh, very good application, and a very common application is the well integrity and casing, uh, casing integrity, which is, uh, as I said before earlier, uh, during the early life stages of the well, we have open hole, and then we case the well, we run casing and cement. And in order to understand the integrity of the cement itself, we need to run what we call a CVL, which is cement bond log, and a VDL, which is a variable density log. Later during this um, uh, internship, uh, my colleague, Maria, she'll be just uh, going through the case hole evaluation and she'll be talking much or touching more base with the CBL and VDL measurements. Uh, for the time being, I'll be just going through the geomechanics and well board geology. So <clears throat> when it comes to geomechanics, in order to understand geomechanics, geomechanics is basically or primarily designed and built on understanding the stresses inside the inside the borehole and uh, also by looking at the density. But in order to understand the stresses, we need to quantify them. And the way we quantify stresses is by looking what, what we call uh, shear anisotropy. So anisotropy from the word itself, if something is called isotropic, with the, this means that in the X, Y, and Z directions, all the properties, the physical properties are equal together. For example, in this case, I would be reading in this direction, 100 microsecond per foot, and in this direction, 100 microsecond per foot. So this is what we call isotropic. But in anisotropic, we have a change in the magnitude of the physical property that we have, dependent on the direction where we measure it. And this comes into play, especially when it comes to evaluating stresses. So due to stresses, due to, let's say, for example, I am stressing the formation from this direction, I'm compacting the formation much more from this direction, I should be expecting to read um, uh, a different uh, slowness compared to this relaxed direction. So if we're applying stresses by just looking at this difference in, in slowness in the different directions, let's say, for example, in X and Y direction, I can easily identify there's a stress regime here that needs to be quantified. But stresses does not only primarily happen, or like anisotropy does not primarily happen due to the uh, maximum horizontal stress and minimum horizontal stress. It can also happen due to fractures, as well as bedding, such as shale. In order to identify if the anisotropy is really related to stresses or the effect of fractures or bedding, we need to start integrating the acoustic and anisotropy results with well bore imaging that will be shown later in order to see if it's really effect, it's the effect of bedding, which comes into shale, that will be evident on the uh, well bore imaging as very lim laminated sand, thin laminated sands, or thin laminated layers. And whether it's just, or whether it's just coming from the stress regime that we have in place down hole uh, that's creating a, a maximum horizontal stress and a minimum horizontal stress. So this is an output of the shear anisotropy. What typically happens is that we uh, measure uh, shear in two different directions. We measure it in the X and Y direction. 
which is shown as here. The difference between the slowness from the x direction and the y direction would show a separation. This separation also contributes to an energy difference between the both waveforms that coming back to the tool. Once we see that there is a change in energy between the x and y direction that's being shown here as a result of this separation, we can identify what we call a fast shear azimuth. Fast shear azimuth is the direction at which the fast shear, which is the fast shear slowness, is propagating. And in um, drilling induced structure, or typically when we have anisotropy, we need to start fracking the well into the direction where we have the uh, magnitude of the fast direction. So in order to start uh, fracking the well where we create a permeable pathway into the formation, we need to do the, know the direction of the stresses, which is being already identified, and also the azimuth of this fast shear azimuth, of this fast shear slowness. Typically, the slow shear slowness or shear azimuth would be 90 degrees from this because we're measuring uh, two components, the X and Y, that are 90 degrees apart. <clears throat> so why do we need to know the direction of the fast shear? So, Direction of the fast shear is very important in order to understand the direction of the fractures because the fractures would primarily um, uh, uh, go in the direction of the high stresses. And also it helps us to estimate and uh, know or visualize the productivity of the well itself. Since the fractures or like the production would follow the fractures itself, which represents the high permeable pathway, then if we have more stresses and we have more fractures into the reservoir, we estimate that there is more permeable zones and this should be contributing to more productivity. Another application for shear anisotropy is that um, avoiding sand production and also optimizing the perforation or um, directing the perforation into the, um, into the direction of the fast shear or the uh, high uh, S max. So in this case, if we identify the um, uh, direction of the minimum stress, and as a result of this, it will be the maximum stress in this direction. If we, perfor if we perforate in the direction of the minimum stress, we mean that we damage the rock, which, which means that there is a high, very, very high probability of having uh, sand production problems during uh, later in time during production. So in this case, we need to orient our uh, perforation into the direction of the fast uh, or the maximum stress. Same goes with uh, us designing the perforation itself. When we start to uh, frag the job or do a fracking job, we need to understand where's the fast shear azimuth direction in order to frack into the direction of the uh, maximum horizontal stress. And in this case, it will be in this direction since it's orthogonal or 90 degrees uh, offset from the minimum stresses. If, you perf if we frack in these directions, the amount of penetration of the frack itself would be very limited and it would be very uh, um, uh, small compared to if we frack into the direction of the maximum horizontal stress. Another application for uh, acoustics is Stoney. So Stoney waveform is a waveform that propagates onto the borehole itself. It does not really go inside the formation. So compression is typically, uh, compression and shear typically gets reflected, uh, refracted and then reflected back to the tool once they get into the formation. But stony, due to the nature of the stony waveform itself, it's a borehole uh, waveform, which means that it typically moves along the borehole wall. It does not really go inside the formation compared to compressional and shear. So compression and shear really goes inside the formation, but stony, they really propagate along the well bore borehole. And this comes into play when we try to identify uh, what we call open fractures. So if we have a waveform that propagates across this borehole all the way up, when it comes to an open fracture, a series of reflection and refraction will be happening at, across this plane as well as, as this plane. So by looking at these reflection and refractions from, from the stony waveform that goes into the well bore, uh, well bore, uh, borehole wall, we can see the, what we call a chevron pattern. So a chevron pattern represents the reflection and the refraction across the borehole. And by just looking at the chevron pattern itself, just barely from the, stony, uh, from the stony waveform, we can identify and easily see what we call open fractures. Open fractures is a very good thing that we need to have in a reservoir in order to make sure that we have a permeable pathway for the fluid inside the borehole 
or in, sorry, inside the formation to flow and produce. This is a very good example where we show a comparison between what we detect uh, using the fast and slow um, uh, shear. So we see this fast shear as in fast shear uh, slowness and slow shear slowness. By looking at the difference between these two together, we can identify there's a difference. There's a difference in terms of the microsecond per foot. And this is correlating to what we see in the terms of energy. So we see that we see a very huge energy difference between uh, these two compression or these, these shear slownesses. And this would represent an anisotropy happening at this uh, interval. But also looking at the stony waveform and by identifying the fractures, we can also see that there is a fracture coming from the stony waveform represented by this uh, purple shading. And we were looking, once we were looking at the FMI images, the images itself, we can see identified that there are drilling induced fractures here. And these fractures were actually uh, shown on the image and they were uh, also shown on the sonic, which means that these fractures are not closed fractures or cemented but in fact, they are uh, liquid bearing fractures, which means that they're open fractures and they could contribute to production later in time. So this shows an, uh, an integration between uh, acoustics and images and how we can come up with different pieces of information on the, on the reservoir itself as um, structure, as well as the stresses in order to design our completion and uh, understand the structure where the deposition environment of this field happened. So now going into the next step, which is the wellbore imaging. <clears throat> so wellbore imaging, it's a, it's a pad tool. It's a tool that measures uh, or injects current into the formation. And this injected current comes back to the tool body where we measure how much current is coming back. And using this current, it's using the same resistivity approach. V is equal to IR. So we have uh, 190 buttons these buttons act as, 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 detect, as uh, transmitters. So we have 109, uh, 192 transmitter into the uh, same, in the single tool that are being divided into uh, what we call uh, four arms. Four arms, there are, um, if you look at the top section of the tool itself, it has one, uh, one, two, three, four. So these arms are like forming a cross or like uh, a plus sign. Uh, and each arm has a pad what we call a pad and what we call a flap. These pad and flap orientation are being done in order to maximize how much current we inject into the formation in order to maximize the image that we can acquire uh, downhole through wellbore imaging. So this is the output of a wellbore imaging uh, tool, an FMI log, for example, which stands for full bore microimager. And this is what we can see actually into the core itself. You can see there is a very strong correlation between what we see down here using FMI or wellbore imaging in general, and what's there actually into the uh, into the nature. So it's it's for the geologist, it's like looking for an outcrop of, of the or the core of the of the of the of the rock itself. And this is a very good way to visualize what's happening down there by just looking at what we can come out with in terms of dipping, how deep the formation is, <clears throat> as well as the contrast between the colors, we can easily identify um, the structure of the reservoir as well as the, any, any geological events that might happen that can be correlated to what we have in the deposition environment and uh, stratigraphy. So another output from FMI <clears throat> or wellbore imaging is dip meter. So dip meter is actually showing how tilted is this uh, layer or this formation uh, compared to the horizontal axis, in this case, which is the north. So what we have is a sinusoid wave, which is a sine wave. We have, as I said, we have four arms, arm one, arm two, arm three, and arm four in, in the, um, uh, four directions. So arm, uh, uh, arm two would be presenting the north, Arm three would be presenting east, south, west, and then back to north. So think of it as you have a full bore core, like you have a cylinder and you just cut it from this side and then you just over, uh, overlap this onto a white, on a, on a table, and then you can see uh, the signature of the waveform. So typically if we have a thin, if we have a laminated, uh, sorry, um, a dipping uh, formation, we should be expecting a sine wave. 
the way we interpret this sine wave in order to identify the angle at which this uh, uh, this layer is dipping is by looking at the um, uh, tan tan theta, which is the theta is between the uh, horizontal axis and the vertical axis, which is in this case. So theta tan theta is equal to the vertical or like the opposite of the uh, of this uh, triangle. Uh, divided by the uh, adjacent, which is in this case 6 divided by 12. And um, uh, tan um, minus 1 theta is equal to six of the 6 over 12 is equal to 27 degrees. So by just doing the very simple calculation, we can uh, get, first of all, the angle at which the dipping is, which is 27 degrees in terms of magnitude. And now we need to understand in which direction. Is it, is it tilting towards the north? east, south, or west. In order to see this, we need to see the trough of the sinusoid. So a peak is something what we consider in a, sin in a sinusoid wave or a sine wave, which is the um, positive part, and a trough, which is the bottom part, so we see the bottom parts. In this case, since it's coming onto the uh, pad one, which is oriented towards the west, this means that in this direction or this uh, angle, or this, sorry, this uh, layer is dipping 27 degrees in terms of magnitude, and it's oriented towards west, which is coming towards uh, the uh, almost third quadrant of a circle. So if you have a circle, north, east, um, uh, south, and west, if we have a 270 degrees, which is typically at west, then uh, coming at this direction, into the west side to represent 20, 270 degrees, and this would represent the direction, the azimuth of this dipping. By just looking at this, we need to uh, identify two things. The trough, which would represent the um, direction, and um, uh, t the difference, or like the tan minus one, the difference between the uh, vertical, uh, vertical section of the triangle and the horizontal section of the triangle in order to identify the magnitude of the dipping itself. In this case, it's 27, de 27 degrees. So by looking at the different images that we can have, these are different four, these are four different wells, well one, well two, well three, well four. By just looking at the image itself, the geologist would start to visualize what's really happening down there, whether we have bugs, whether we have laminations and compactions, whether we have fractures, whether we have anticline, synecline, all these kind of structures and the position environment. By integrating and understanding or uh, visualizing what happens down hole with images and acoustics, we can um, design and uh, see the, how to complete the well and also understand how the pre to, to estimate how the production can be optimized using the stresses that we can compute into the, um, into the borehole and the reservoir. This is the same example as I said before. So it's just showing how the integration would work. So the sonic and image, they just go hand in hand when it comes uh, into uh, structure analysis and the position environment uh, interpretation, as well as understanding the stresses when it comes to production and designing uh, how to produce the well or reservoir. <coughs> so by doing this, we have identified uh, the, the, the reservoir structure and completion design by integrating acoustics and wellbore imaging. And then we we'll go now to the next, the final stage, which is the reservoir pressure points and sampling. Um, in this case, uh, in order to acquire a pressure point in sampling, we need to uh, lower uh, pressure sampling tool, which is typically uh, a tool that has a vacuum inside, and then it has uh, a probe, what we call uh, an inlet probe that can um, uh, allow fluid to go inside the formation. And then once we create a drawdown, which is a negative pressure, then we can identify and measure and the reservoir pressure itself inside the formation. So this is very important when we start to appraise a well in order to understand the uh, expected reservoir pressure. Uh, reservoir pressure represents how um, um, the power of the reservoir itself and uh, the more, the higher the pressure, the more the reservoir can be easily flown through natural production and can naturally produ produce the less the pressure, the, this means that we have um, to start looking for different uh, ways to produce, such as, for example, ESP or sacro rod, et cetera. 
Uh, also through pressure point identification, we can uh, develop what we call pressure gradient. So pressure gradient gives us an insight on the type of fluid that we can have. We can have uh, uh, gas, oil, and water. And also by looking at the pressure point and the drawdown that we make, we can estimate the mobility, mobility which is an equal to uh, K over mu, where K represents uh, permeability and mu is the fluid viscosity. So mobility is directly proportional to uh, permeability and uh, it's inversely proportional to viscosity. On top of that, we can also acquire downhole fluid samples for PVT analysis for pressure, volume, and temperature in order to understand the type of fluid or uh, hydrocarbon that we have in place. So as I said, we can uh, look at the gradients at different, from different wells at different reservoirs and looking just by the gradient, which is uh, typically the pressure points are being uh, plotted at uh, depth versus pressure uh, um, uh, log, log view. And by looking at the gradients itself, we can identify the gradient of water and identify the gradient of gas through the intersection between the water gradient and the gas gradient. We can identify the gas gas or gas water contact as well as the gas water contact in this in this reservoir. So from the pressure itself, we can estimate two things: the contacts, which is the intersection between the trend line of gas and the trend line of water, and also we can identify the mobility of the reservoir, and we can also identify the uh, uh, fluid type that we have in the reservoir. So here's a schematic uh, or a brief uh, uh, schematic explaining how we start measuring pressure. So for a pressure to be measured, we need to create a negative pressure inside the tool. We need to make a delta P. This negative pressure is typically happening due to the vacuum that we create inside the tool. So what, what typically happens is that we go to the formation that we need to test or we need to measure the pressure for we uh, put the tool in stationary mode and then we inject or insert what we call a packer. This packer comes into contact with the formation. So this is the formation and this is the borehole itself. And this probe now is uh, completely in contact with the formation, which makes a seal, a complete seal. And the only communication now that will be happening is coming from the formation itself all the way inside the tool through this uh, flow line. So once we have the piston at uh, uh, position zero, for example, then we start to create a drawdown. We start to move the piston inside the tool in order to create a negative pressure. So negative pressure starts to build up at this in this vacuum. So once we reach to the this uh, certain position, we start to uh, go to what we call the um, drawdown limit. This drawdown limit is the time where we start to stop the piston itself and wait for anything from the formation to come inside the uh, piston or the vacuum itself. So typically what would flow from the formation into the piston into the vacuum itself in this case would be the embedded fluid. It would not be the formation fluid, the version fluid, because it's, very, it's a very small uh, compartment or a very small uh, uh, volume that we actually move into and it's typically around 20 centimeter cube. Uh, in this case, we are just uh, assuming that whatever response is coming from the formation deep inside is the same as the, what we have in the invaded zone. We wait for a certain period of time, and then what happens is that we stop the piston, as I said, and later we start to uh, get what we call a formation response. Once this formation response stabilizes, which is the pressure versus time, once this is stabilized, this would show the expected um, uh, formation pressure in this reservoir. So anything under this, the area under this curve, under this, uh, let's say we have a, a, a another line, this line extended a little bit more, anything lying under this zone is contributing to the mobility. The bigger the area under the curve, the higher the mobility, which means the higher the permeability the smaller this area under the curve, which we would contribute to uh, less permeability as well as less mobility. So this is typically how we measure pressure. We make an, a negative pressure inside the tool. We have formation coming or like the fluid coming inside the, for, uh, inside the tool and then we measure it through a, a gauge or a sensor inside the tool. And then once we stop the piston, we start to see any effect coming from the formation itself. And as a buildup, this, pressure buildup starts to rise, uh, 
and stabilizes at a certain period, at a certain uh, pressure, this would be contributing to the formation pressure in PSI. So by getting different pressure points at different depths, so this is depth versus pressure, we get different points at different depth, we can get the trend lines of the different fluids that we have, such as water, oil, or gas, and then by connecting or intersecting trend lines together, we can get the contacts of each and every fluid, for example, gas, oil contact, or oil, water contact. So these are typical values for the oil and um, for the gradients that we have for gas, oil, and water. But now for sampling to happen, we need to start pumping at a very high rate instead of just relying on the very small chamber or the very small volume that we have, which is 20 centimeter cube in terms of pressure points. We need to have uh, bigger bottles or bigger flow lines in order to uh, get what we need in this case, which is the uh, virgin fluid. So we're using the same probe, same type of tool, exactly the same, but the only thing that's only added to this is another set of tools uh, above it, which has uh, a bigger flow line. It has a pump, literally a pump, where we start pumping and try to clean the formation, uh, on, like the filtrate, the mud filtrate into the invaded zone. And then once we reach to a, a stabilized uh, flow, we can start getting what we need to have in place, which is the oil coming from the very uh, deep inside the formation, which is the virgin zone. So the more we pump, the cleaner the sample will be because we're basically removing a lot of filtrate that's coming inside the uh, invaded zone. And the better the analysis, the better the quality of the sample will be. So this uh, fluid sample, since they're being uh, pumped all the way up, they're being dumped into the tool. And then once we reach to an agreement that this is a clean sample, and now we're getting less contamination from the mud filtrate, uh, we start to collect the fluid samples, the oil or the clean fluid sample inside bottles. These bottles are also inside the tool itself. They're like, they're shown here in, in the schematic. And these bottles are being collecting the fluid samples at PVT conditions, which is the pressure and, volume, uh, pressure and temperature reservoir in situ conditions in order to be sent for uh, PVT analysis. So they preserve the fluid, uh, uh, properties at the in situ conditions, pressure and reservoir, uh, reservoir pressure and reservoir temperature for the proper analysis for PVT. So by doing this, we have identified uh, our uh, volumes com coming from starting from shale, lithology, and then going to saturation of hydrocarbon, identifying if we have a mobile fluid or not, and then we go to design and understanding the structure in order to complete the well, and then finally, uh, we start to uh, get the fluid sample that is typically, in this case, oil or gas. And this is the primary objective of open hole model. So um, <clears throat> this is just a basic overview of formation evaluation. So um, let's say it's like a, a cheat sheet, for example. Uh, in order to start doing a formation evaluation exercise, you need to identify a low gamma ray, which should be presenting a clean zone, typical reservoir. And then we look at the resistivity. If we have a low resistivity, it's possibly wet. If we have a high resistivity, it's, it's, it can be two things. It can be hydrocarbon bearing zone or it can be a tight zone. So in order to identify this, we need to check the porosity. If we have a low porosity, it's likely to be uh, tight, which is not pay, and uh, which is not a pay zone. And if, it's a, if it has a high porosity, then this high resistivity is actually contributing or coming as a, as a result of fluid that's very resistive. And this is a possible pay zone. Once we identify our pay zones using the simplified workflow, we can start our uh, quantitative analysis using uh, different uh, softwares that's there in the market, which is one of them is TechLog, and that's being provided by Schlumberger through SIS, Software Integrated uh, um, Solutions. Through um, TechLog, if you have a TechLog version that you can use, you can just create a project, you just go under the, under the petrophysics tab and you can go to Quanti Elan. Quanti Elan, it has four steps. These four steps are in sequence and they have to be done in sequence. So we start with what we call initialization. Then we form, once we finish this, we go to Quanti Elan. And then once we're done with this, we go to combine models. And then once we're done with this, we go to processing. So these has to be done in sequence. Once these steps are being done using the data that you acquire in open home logging, you can come up with what we call as a post-processing uh, or the 
uh, final view of the formation evaluation, which is shown in the, um, at the bottom here. To have a closer look of this, so typically what we're expecting is to identify the shale volume, which is considered here as B-clay. And then we also need to identify the lithology, which is the um, uh, lithology in this case, which is elite, the type of clay that we have, and uh, quartz, and how much fluid that we have on top of fluid, which is in this case gas, oil, and water. And as well as identifying the porosity of the reservoir, as well as the saturation, because these V-shale saturation and porosity comes into play when we try to identify and isolate how much uh, sand or how much gross sand we have, we have. And this is done through identifying and using the three outputs from uh, post-processing. Typically, we have uh, V-clay, porosity, and saturation. These uh, three outputs coming from formation evaluation are being, in, uh, are being used. And by applying certain cutoffs, we can identify what represents the rock. So for identifying presenting the rock or using or getting the rock uh, as a as a as a as the reservoir is being uh, evaluated we need to apply a cutoff on v shale we need to say okay if the v shale is greater than this value uh, which is let's say for example 0.5 then anything higher than 0.5 v shale is considered a shale and anything below that it's considered clean zone once we identify the rock, we apply a second cutoff, which is representing a reservoir. And in order to uh, compute the reservoir thickness, we apply a cutoff on porosity. So let's say we have a porosity unit of uh, 20 PU. Anything greater than 20 PU is considered as reservoir. Anything below that is considered non-reservoir. And then once we need to identify the pay zone, which is the thickness, the net thickness, when it, when, which is a primary input when it comes to oil, original oil in place equation, as I've shown before in the uh, beginning of the slides, we need to apply a third cutoff. And this third cutoff comes to saturation. So we have uh, three type of cutoffs that we need to apply to identify rock, reservoir, and pay. So first of all, we identify rock by applying a, a shale volume cutoff. And then once we identify the rock, we apply another cutoff using uh, porosity in order to identify reservoir. And then once we identify the reservoir, we apply a third cutoff, which identifies the pay. And this pay thickness, instead of having this big cross section or like this thickness as a reservoir, now it just came to this producible fluid that can be contributing to the total production later in time. And this is the depth or the thickness that's being used into the original original only place equation. So these are some references and some useful links that can be uh, handy when it comes to understanding um, uh, log interpretation, uh, looking at the catalog of the wireline services that we can provide, as well as having uh, a more practical insight on the theory, uh, whether to open hole logging or case hole logging. Thank you very much for today, and um, I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks. Thank you so much, Engineer Khaled, for the very dense and very informative presentation. Uh, for everyone, we have got, we got like lots and lots of questions. I gathered as many as I could, and I'll, I'll be sending them to Engineer Khaled, and he will be answering them. So thank you so much for joining and tuning in today. Uh, you can always go back and rewatch the whole webinar on our YouTube channel. So you get, you know, better focus. Uh, 